I need at least one volunteer. Uh, Tamara, you're volunteering. Thank you. Come on up here real quick. Hurry, 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 hurry. Here we go. Are you ready? You are Vanna White right now. So this is a black marker right here. So see this right here. So this is numbers. Numbers. This will be songs. Okay. You are you ready? We don't know each other, right? We've never met. This is the first time you've ever seen. How many beans do I have in here? John. Uh, 51. 51. <coughs> Put 51 down there. It, how many beans? How many beans? I'm looking right at you. Uh, yes. 64. 64. There's a prize. So we better be trying really hard. Andrew, how many beans? <laughs> Five. <laughs> Five is the guess here. Robbie, how many beans? Seventy-two. Seventy-two. Miss B, how many beans? Seventy. Seventy. How many beans, Darren? Last. No, Miss Chris, you'll be the last, Darren. Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven, and then Krista. It's. I know. You want to weigh them? Yeah. <laughs> Forty. Forty. <laughs> okay. What's the highest number there? Uh, seventy-two. Six, seventy-two. Circle seventy-two. There's two hundred and nineteen beans. <laughs> two hundred and nineteen. You guys are some un. Yes. We couldn't see beans. the diameter of it. They're like small. Two hundred nineteen. Hey, Who has? Yeah, Who has seventy-two? Miss B, do you have 72? You get a prize. I mean, I have 72 or 70. Who had 72? I think Robbie did. I think yeah, Robbie had 72. Prize? See? It's a picture of me. <laughs> uh, it's a great big one. It's a big, big one. It's really nice. So, okay, so how many answers have we got? So, uh, we have, so 72. There we go. That's that. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is going to be harder, okay? Because now we're going to go to the second phase of this, Miss Van White. I want to know what is the best song ever composed, written, or sang. Brandon, what's the best? Now you better be thinking, because if I call on you, I just want you to shoot it out there. I don't want you to have to think about it, okay, Brandon? The best song ever. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Oh, this is a church group, so I'm just like, stairway to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Christian. John. Uh, Redemption Songs by Bob Martin. <laughs> By the way, both are very well-read hippies, John. <laughs> Seriously, you two, you guys are just, I mean, that's you, by the way, in years with the hair and the, yeah. Generally, he has this beard that comes down to here. Where he, he normally has as much black. beard as you have hair. <laughs> Best song ever. How Great Thou Art. She took my song. Andrew, the best song ever. <laughs> Son, now, come on, chop chop. <laughs> I'm gonna get back to you because I want to know what's your favorite, Dana. <laughs> You're supposed to be thinking the best song. Just give me the the song that comes to your mind. Oh, you guys, come on. Yes. He lives. Yes. I have a dream. From a movie. I have a dream. I do have that. Elvis Presley. To dream of a better place where all my brothers. I know that song. Yes, Craig. The pirates who don't do anything. The pirates who don't do anything. There you go. How many do we got? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I need one more. Kristen. What a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. Right. Yes or no? Yes. 
this. Is there an answer up here that is closer to being right than the others? Yes. When it comes to the beans, there was a right answer and there were many apparently wrong answers. There was, you guys weren't even close. You weren't even in the same ballpark. All right. Now my next question is, is there a right answer here? No. No. There's no... Sure there is. What was the yeah, question? <laughs> <laughs> the pirates who don't do anything. Randy's going to get all philosophical on me. And, and I, I know his point, but don't go there. Is there a right answer here for the most part? John, do you agree that the pirates who don't do anything is the correct answer? That is the best song ever no. made no. ever. No, it's okay. But it's not good. Okay, he lives. Is that the best song ever? That's all right. It's all right, but it's <laughs> probably not the best song. Wonderful song. <laughs> there are right answers with this one, right? And there is really no right answers right here. So we would call that so, different types of truth. Does anyone want to care to guess what type of truth this is called? It rhymes with well, objective. <laughs> <laughs> objective truth, and this one rhymes with. Well, objective too, ironically. <laughs> subjective. Subjective type of truth. Okay, here's my real question. Okay, and I don't want you to answer this one. Are you ready? When you decide what to believe in terms of your faith, is that more like guessing the number of beans? Or is that more like saying what the best song is? Is it objective? Did you want to preach because you got that cool suit on? Or is it <laughs> subject? Some are saying subjective, some are saying objective right here. We're going to kind of look at Is there a right answer and a wrong answer when it comes to your matter of faith? Or is it just a matter of personal taste? Please keep your answers to yourself. But let's just assume there's somebody out there that thinks there's an objective way, and let's just assume that there are some of you who think that it is a subjective way to approach your faith. Let's assume some of you think that there's a right answer and a wrong answer, and let's assume some of you out there think that, you know what, it just depends on your own personal taste. If, if you believe that your faith, what you decide about your faith, is based on your own personal taste, I have to tell you this, good news you are in the majority of people in this country who probably believe that it's subjective. If you want to be a Mormon, then by all means, go out there and be a Mormon. Get you some magic underwear. Do you know they wear magic underwear? I, I used to have underoos. I love my underoos, but they don't make those anymore for my size, and if they did, my birthday's coming up next week. Spider-Man is what I'm looking for. <laughs> Spider-Man under roofs. Okay. Um, if you think that Islam, and Greg's got this I Islam uh, pen on his It's just a sword. That's, that's Muslim right there. So then you go ahead and word. get the praying. If you, you think that huma humanity is the best help for humanity, then you be... Humanist, Christian, pick Christian pagan. Anyone ever met a Christian pagan? <laughs> yes. There's, there's Christian pagans out there. They, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. I don't know. They're Christ, they dance naked around trees, which I'm all right with that. But, um, but basically, this way is whatever floats your boat, right? Whatever floats your boat. <clears throat> you know what? I, 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 I'm getting this, and, and I may be wrong right there. I believe that the majority sees faith as something that gets you through life. And so, it doesn't really matter what you pick, what you choose, as long as it really gets you through life right here. Now, the objective people, those of you who think that faith is objective, I have sad news for you. You are the minority. You believe that faith is either right or it's wrong, and it's, it's not a matter of how you feel about it. It's a matter of objective truth. There's right answers, and there's wrong answers. It's sad, not that you believe that. It's just sad that this is the minority view. Because I, 
I believe it's the biblical view point that faith is a matter of objective truth right there. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not opposed to having things out there that get you through life. I think Reese's peanut butter cups are a godsend. Um, they help me get through life. I love Reese's. You know the Easter ones have come out? The Easter egg, have you seen those? Those are the best. They have the right amount of chocolate, the right amount of peanut butter, proportionately. They are probably the next best <coughs> in perfection. Google Calendar helps me get through life. Without Google Calendar, I would not be able to do the things that I do. I can color code everything. Try it. Great. Don't laugh at me with your Muslim pen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the fact that you can color code it. That's what makes Google Calendar the best. Dude, you can, because I like to say, oh, all right, I have a portion of my week that I have to do at one ministry, a portion of my week that I do at this ministry, a portion I do with this, and a portion that I do with this. I can just look at it at any given week and look, 15% is yellow. I need to up that up to 20%. See, you guys do this right. <laughs> <laughs> budget, 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 time, money, and calories. Live long, prosper. Star Trek. <laughs> which is 2% of my yearly time spent on that. I'm not opposed to things getting through life, but for those of you who believe, real quick, maybe, maybe faith is subjective, and maybe, maybe it's, it's just something that gets you through life, I would argue that the last thing you need in a faith is it some sort of placebo. John's a brilliant man, what's a placebo? Quick! It's uh, nothing that does something. Because you believe it. Okay, can somebody better than John give me the answer what a placebo is? <laughs> That's not it. Where's Rick? Randy, what's a placebo? I like that. Something that does nothing. I, I think that's about as good as <laughs> this is <a> subjective <laughs> favorite songs. Placebo is something. <laughs> I'm going to say the same thing. I don't know. It's. It, it doesn't really do the trick. It's a medicine, okay? It's kind of like a medicine. If Let's say John has a terminal uh, disease of liberalism, and he's this crazy liberal, and I say, John, I've got this magic pill that if you take it, it's going to turn you into a conservative. And John's like, I've always wanted to be a conservative. I want to get me like a bow tie. By the way, I'm going to start doing bow ties next week. And I, I give him that, and because his mind thinks it's going to make him into a conservative, he takes that pill and automatically... He's a conservative. Right? It's kind of like a placebo. That's an illustration, not a philosophical thing that you did right there. I don't want a faith that doesn't really work. I don't want a faith that just gets me through life. I don't want to get on an airplane and up until the time it crashes, the flight was pretty smooth. I don't want something that just gets me through life. I want a real faith. I want a faith that, you've probably heard this if you've read the Bible, that moves mountains. Not only does it help me in every step of my life, it tells me to, to move in this direction, but it also gets me through the very hard times, but it also lands the proverbial plane, if you will, on the other side. I want a real faith. One that... I don't want to say that works, but one that really trusts in something, <coughs> right or wrong. I believe that the Christian faith is that faith. I believe that the Christian faith is an objective faith. And I believe that all the other faiths, even though you may choose it, you may pick it, they are by definition wrong because the Christian faith is right. There's a right answer, then there's a wrong answer. The Christian faith is the right answer. The thing that I want to kind of quickly discuss today before we go into dismiss most of you for and go into the business meeting is... How? What are some of the elements of a real faith? And I've got some scripture up here on the board. We've got this. Uh, here's your first scripture. Um, take that off for a second. Go backwards real quick. Let me tell you the answer. The elements to a real faith. And this is genius, I think. It's very simplistic. You want to write this down? You sure can. You don't have to. Ready? Here it is. The elements to a real faith. believe in the real true God. You believe that he's right. So much
does so, that you act accordingly. Here are the elements to a real faith. You believe in the real truth of God. You believe he is right. And you act accordingly. Let's break this down. Go to Hebrews 1, 6. It says, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, who was the book of Hebrews written to? Does anyone know? Hebrews. Hebrews. No. If John knows this answer, it was to Christians, right? Christians who had a strong what background? Jewish. Jewish background, a strong Jewish background, wasn't to a group of atheists. So this method right there that says, go back there, keep the text up there. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This message is given to somebody who already believes. You have to believe that God exists. Does anyone have trouble in this room believing that God exists? I would challenge you and I would say most of you. I think sometimes you forget. It's the only logical conclusion after all the stupid things that some of us do. Let me quickly illustrate. I found out the other day, my little girl, Isabella, she's playing. She's got the toys on the table. She has one particular toy, and she walks away from the toy she comes up to me and she says, Dad, I said, yes, Princess. I don't like that. I said, it's a clown. I don't like a clown. There's a jack in the box. So I went over there. To, does anyone, anyone else afraid of clowns? Okay, I'm speaking of the car. No one's afraid of clowns? Dude, really, come on, they wear makeup, it's always a smile. They're freaky. Anyway, I, I put the clown in the box, I close the jack in the box, and I take it away from her. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. You bring this up to her. She, she's scared. Clown's been out of sight for a couple of days. So here's my experiment tonight. I'm going to put her to bed. I'm going to lay her down in her bedroom, little princess bed. I'm going to kiss her on her cheek. Night, baby, I love you. And then I'm going to remind her about clowns. I said, Isabella, you know clowns are real, don't you? <laughs> don't worry, honey, they're nocturnal. <laughs> that means as long as that light's on, they're not coming in. There may be one under your bed. I don't know. I'm not brave enough to look. Give her a kiss on the cheek. Walk to the door. Night, baby. Turn off the light. Close the door. <clears throat> what, Christy? You're shaking your head no. And you will have a little girl between you and Dana and like three nights. <laughs> or it happens anyway. Every time I wake up, I just turn over and like, hey, baby, and there's Bella. Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, it's pretty scary in our house, right? Can I ask you to seriously, if, if, if you really uh, uh, continuously believe in the real true God, do you know that he's omnipresent? You know that, right? What does omnipresent mean? Anybody? you got to sit on What's it mean? <laughs> Anybody else? What does omnipresent mean? Rick, what's omnipresent? Your wife pointed at you. Hmm. Yeah. Everywhere. He's everywhere. Do you really believe right now God is here with us? Okay, do you really believe that when nobody else is around you, that God is with you? Why do you do the stupid things that you do, knowing that not only He's with you, but He hates some of the things that you do? Because sometimes we purposely, what? Forget that He's here. It says in the scripture, and it's not up there right there, that says that we walk by faith. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That we walk by faith, not by what? Sight. Sight. That means every step of the way, every single day, every single hour, we're walking in faith, we're trusting in the Lord, we're moving forward in life, trusting in the God. But I guarantee you that there are some people in this room today, 
even though we don't have a big crowd today, I still guarantee you there's some people in this room today that have not thought that God exists in the last maybe week. Since the last time you were at church. And it crushed your mind. You forgot. Purposefully, maybe. Or maybe that he's just not that much of a part of your life in the first place, that he's just out of sight, out of mind. He's not here. There's another text, and this is in James right here. This talks about forgetting. It says, James says this, but let him ask in faith, n n uh, nothing doubting, this is not in IV, for he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea driven by the wind and tossed, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Have you ever heard the term, there is no such thing as a foxhole atheist? When the bullets are flying, everybody is a believer. Have you ever thought that on an airplane, when it's going down for the last time and it's about ready to crash, that there are a lot of new Christian converts? <coughs> Excuse me. I need to <coughs> quit smoking, apparently. Um, you believe, you, you'd be surprised at how, 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 how much your faith increases when things get bad, don't you? I don't think so. I think that if we purposely and continuously push him out of our lives because we don't like his presence, when we are doing the things that we know we ought not to do, if we go through life day in, day out, and not even thinking about it, he's not even a part of our life, when the time comes and we need him, we may come to him if you really don't have that intimate relationship with him, it's really hard to trust on him when you really need him. And I think that's what that text really speaks to. You want to have a real faith. The very primary, just, just the very basics is this. You've got to believe that he is there. That the real true God exists right there. But of course that is... Just foundational. It's, it doesn't mean that that's alone. Uh, James, is that the next? Is that another text right up there uh, that follows? It says, "You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe in their shudder." I mean, it's it, e even though that you know that He exists. There's a lot of people that knows that God exists, but the last thing that we would say is that they have the faith of um, a real, true faith. The second thing is you've got to what? You, you have to believe that He exists. And number two, you have to believe He is what? Right. right. I heard uh, Randy's class talk about this today. Joe. Right? You guys were talking about Joe when I came in. Weren't you? Job. We talk about the faith of Joe. You ever heard that? Real quick snapshot. Joe. Business, gone. Kids, dead. House, dead. Friends, enemies. Wife, encouraging suicide. Skin, Boils. So much so that they had taken broken pottery, smash it on the ground, and take that broken glass and start scratching and trying to rip it off. We talk about the faith of Job. In fact, his wife did say, You know what, you ought to just kill yourself. It's like, Shall we not accept the good? Shall we accept the good and not the bad? It comes from God. Later it says, Though he slay me, I will always put my hope in Him. How is it even possible for a man to do that? Did God, did, excuse me, did Job ever ask God why? Yes. He did. <laughs> Wouldn't you, though? Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes we ask God why when our Reese's peanut butter cup is stale. He asked God why. Did God give him an answer? Did God tell him why? 
He didn't tell him why. No. What did he tell him? He gave an answer. He gave an answer. He asked him about 60, 70 questions that Joe couldn't answer. Hey, when God does that, you ask God a question, God comes back with 60 or 70 questions. You know what some of the questions were? Where were you, Joe? I forget. When I told the waves, the mighty waves, that they could come this far and no further. Where were you, Joe, when I spoke the stars into existence? Where were you, Joe, when I put the clouds in the sky? Where were you, Joe, when I created the sky? Where were you, Joe? And he went on and on and on about all of the powerful and wonderful things that God has done. Now, why would he do that? I think he's reminding Joe of something. Joe, I'm in control. And Job, I'm good. Brothers and sisters, if you can wrap your mind around that thing about God, that he is in control and that he is good, no matter what situation you find yourself in, all you can do is have faith in him. Chris, you're a, you like to stick people with metal objects and suck out the blood, right? That's your job. <laughs> Whatever, you say it the way you want to say it, I'll say it the way that I want to say it. I know that if I went into the doctors and Chris came in there smiling, <laughs> saying, please expose some skin for me, I would do it. I would allow Chris to stab me with her steely blade, suck out the blood, the very life force. I would undergo the pain. Because I'm sure Chris would miss a couple of times for fun. <laughs> Do you know why <coughs> I would undergo such nightmarish, macabre scenario? You're at the wrong angle. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because I trust. Because I know that Chris is looking out for my best interests and that she really wants the best for me. How much so, how much more so, God is in control. No, we don't understand the pain that we sometimes go through. He is good. You wrap your arms and mind around that, you'll understand real faith. God is not only right, he's always right. I'm going to put a picture up here real quick. Somebody see who knows it, this gentleman. Does anybody know who this pastor is? Giglio. You're, is that how you pronounce that, Pastor Giglio? Mm -hmm. Right there. Does anyone know the significance of this gentleman? By the way, he's not wearing a tie. He's wearing a blue jean jacket. I'm going to start wearing Blue jean jacket and bow tie next week. That's my new <laughs> Blue jean jacket. Anybody know the significance of him? He was the pastor who was invited to do the benediction. That's a prayer. At the end, no, 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 just keep him up there. At the end of President Obama's inaugural um, inauguration. Uh -huh. inauguration. Yes, inauguration. Which is when? That's like a. Is it Feb? When is that? Next it's like week, week. Next week. week. Next week. Unfortunately, Pastor Giglio, Giglio was disinvited. Does anyone know why he was disinvited? Twenty years ago, he gave a sermon where he said that he believed that homosexuality is not right. He. He preached that um, homosexuals needed, needed Christ. He was disinvited. Now, I, I want to set the homosexual issue down for the, the, the moment because that, that's irrelevant. What I want to bring up to you real quick is the president's or the White House's response. Because I think, you know what leaders do? Leaders are the first one who says what the masses think. 
Okay? Leaders are the ones who are, articulate what is in the heart of the masses. So bring this up. So this is the White House response. <laughs> we were not aware of Pastor Giglio's past comments at the time of the selection. I mean, he said it 20 years ago. We will now work to select someone to deliver the benediction. We will ensure their beliefs reflect this administration's vision of inclusion and acceptance for all Americans. Let's, let's put that up there again. We will ensure the, their beliefs, the beliefs of the pastor, the beliefs of the person who's going to sit there and bring me a Bible where I'm going to swear to it, their beliefs are going to reflect my beliefs. Beautifully stated. He's really captured the thoughts of most Americans. I think it was said even better in the Bible, though. 2 Timothy 4.3 says this, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Just take homosexuality off the table because that, that's, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what it is because I assure you, if not this, it would be something else. It's, it's nothing more than an example of how the majority approaches faith. And listen to me real quickly. If you reject the things in what God has said, if you reject what He has spoken about this because the majority of the people have a different viewpoint, because even though everybody out there in this world or even everybody in here has a different viewpoint of this and their whatever, their speeches or they're going to they're gonna call you hate, whatever it is, you reject what God has said and you go with the masses. The last thing you should call yourself is a person of faith. At least a real faith. You have faith in who? Humanity. Not God. It says in the Psalms right here. Got the Psalms? For righteous are you, O Lord, and your laws are always right. By definition, having faith in Him must mean that you believe that He is right over anyone else. You want to have a real faith, a faith that can move mountains? You have to believe a real God exists and that He is right so much so that you act accordingly. In your class, John, you talked a little bit about Abraham. Actually, it's one of my favorite texts right there. It's uh, Genesis 22. Abraham was wrestling with something. He was wrestling with something that seemed to contradict everything he believed. Here he had God earlier in his life. He said that through you, Abraham, many nations are going to come about. He did trust God. He did trust God. Eventually, his son came into existence. His only son. This is his only shot. He's only going to get one more. He's an old dude. All right? Later on, God tells him something that seems to contradict this. He says, here's what I want you to do. Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him, and I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham did. He took him up. He went for a walk. He told his, his helpers what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to take my boy over here, and uh, we're going to be gone for a few days. We'll be back later. He even wrestled with it in his mind. How is it possible that all nations, many nations are going to come from, from me, and my care said through him, but if I kill him, how's that going to work out? It says in Hebrews that he reasoned. He said, well, God can bring it back from the dead. See, Christians, most of the time, that's where we think faith takes place. We agree with God in our mind. That's where we think faith takes place. It's just, it's just, I believe him. Not with God. He lays his son on the altar. He gets his steely knife out. Right? His sharp. Both hands. And drive it through his chest cavity. He lifts it up. <coughs> he gets stopped right there. The theology. What does the angel of the Lord tell him? Beautiful statement. He says, Now! 
I know that you believe in God. You want to have a faith that moves mountains? Get this. You need to believe that God exists. You need to believe that His ways are right. So much so that you act in accordance with that. If you do not act in accordance with that, you can say He's right, but it's lip service. You can believe that He exists, but not to the point that's convinced you to do something about it. Only upon action does faith manifest itself. Search the Bible and see if I'm wrong. When does the water part? When the foot hits the water. When do the buildings fall? When the trumpet is blasted. Faith is believing he exists and is saying he is right and acting in accordance that he was. There's a, um, a famous Hebrews passage right here, 11.1. 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Every time I think of this text and I read this text, <laughs> there's this story about that happened during the Blitz, what's it called, the Blitzkrieg? Is that correct? Blitzkrieg, the German in, in advanced? Yep. Is it Blitzkrieg, right? Blitzkrieg. Um, of course, they came in and they bombed the heck out of civilians right there. One house in particular got hit. It was a two-story house, and, and the family, for uh, the most part, were on the first floor. Son was on the second floor. Family runs out of the house, and the and, and house is in, in just, just totally consumed in flames. And, and the boy gets out on the second floor. Um, on the roof. He goes out the window and he's on the second floor. And all he can see is smoke rising up. And he sees the, the, the red flames just, 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 just licking at him. And, and he's stuck. It's a two-story house. Scared to death. And then he hears his dad saying, Son, jump. So he says, I can't jump. I, 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 I can't. I, I can't jump. His dad says, "Don't worry, son. I'll catch you." His son says, "Dad, I can't. I, I can't see you." Father yells up. Don't worry, boy. I can see you. What the boy hoped for. His dad would catch him. Was the boy sure of it? Yeah. He jumped. Brothers and sisters, and I'm ending on this real quick. If your faith is nothing more than a placebo, if your faith is nothing more than something that just gets you through life, you pull it out when you need it, it's subjective, it doesn't really matter, you jump. You ain't getting caught. Your faith is real, though, that God who loves you, who gave this life for you, tells you to do something, you need to do it. Even though you can't see Him, I assure you, He can see you.